So our next speakers are Dr. Um, Ellen Heron and Dr. Chris Sheldrick from Tufts Medical School. And together they have developed a survey of well-being of young children, which is a powerful screening um, and monitoring tool for early childhood education and care. Today they're going to tell us about the survey and how it can be used in clinical care to advance the science of screening. Welcome. Great. Well, it's great to be here with so many friends and colleagues and the ability to meet more, more friends and colleagues. And it's particularly a treat to follow this amazing set of speakers we've had so far this morning and this afternoon and will continue to. So in particular, um, Nadine challenged us to do systematic screening in primary care to inform our monitoring and prevention and treatment of um, activities in, in pediatrics. And Jack uh, challenged us to find a way to identify which children are experiencing stressors that are beyond their ability to cope. So Chris and I are going to talk to you a little bit about a screening instrument that we've developed that's called the Survey for Well-Being of Young Children. Um, I want to just acknowledge before I start um, the third, the third part, member of the team who's here, which is Kate Mattern, who's been just a very important part of the team as well, although she won't be speaking today. So, oops. Um, so just by way of background, um, tw at least 20%, probably closer to 25% of children have developmental, emotional, or behavioral disabilities. We know that those are higher or more likely among children who are born prematurely, living in poverty, or who have a chronic health condition. We also know that few of them are adequately and promptly treated. And it is, in addition to that, their prevalence is increasing. So I want to show you some numbers from the National Health Interview Survey, which um, has been keeping track of the, um, dis the disabilities that children that have been reported by children's parents to be limiting their ability to do the things that, typ that children typically do, so going to school, playing, and so forth. So um, as you can see, over the 10 years, from 2001 to 2010 or 11, um, there's been an increase in prevalence of um, disabilities due to chronic conditions uh, of about 16%. When you take that apart and you look at the disabilities, the, uh, the limitation of activity that's due to a chronic physical activity, the numbers have actually gone down a little bit. On the other hand, the um, prevalence of, of disabilities, um, lim activity limitation disabilities um, due to a neurodevelopmental or mental health disability, those have gone up by about 21%. So this is all by way of background of, of for w why we're talking about the, the kinds of issues that we're talking about and why we developed this instrument. So a number of people this morning talked about pediatrics as being sort of an ideal site for prevention and early intervention, and we would agree with that. Um, it's the ideal site for a number of reasons. First of all, virtually all parents use primary care in one way or another, and they use it frequently. So uh, pediatricians have the opportunity to develop relationships with children and their parents over several years, and it tends to be a very trusted and um, safe relationship. Pediatricians also have a, sort of a, take a sort of comprehensive view of children's well-being. Um, and there's relatively little stigma involved in being involved with pediatric care. On the other hand, pediatricians are very challenged, and we talked about that a little bit this morning as well. Um, there's never enough time, there are never enough resources, um, and pediatricians are faced with complex recommendations um, of all the things that they should be doing in what usually ends up being a 10 or 15 minute visit. Um, screening instruments so far, validated screening instruments at least, are not included in any of the electronic medical records. Um, Follow-up resources are hard to access, and in fact, um, most of them are not very effective. So there are a lot of problems with pediatricians taking on the challenge that a number of people this morning, and I, I would agree, have, have um, given to them. In addition to that, and I think Fan mentioned this this morning, that Pediatricians are supposed to be screening for so many things. They're supposed to be screening for postpartum depression and autism and developmental delays and motor delays and ADHD and 
um, substance abuse, and somebody went ahead and added the ACEs, <laughs> um, as, uh, as Nadine talked about this morning. So uh, there's just a lot to do. And though each of those uh, conditions for which pediatricians are supposed to be screening, it, um, ha there, there are multiple tools for each of those conditions, and the tools all have different schedules and different scoring um, rules. And there are different resources for follow-up. So pediatricians have sometimes talked about drowning in a sea of advice. One of those great titles that was actually published. Um, so with all of that background, um, Chris and I decided to, to uh, plunge in and to develop something that we've been that we call the Survey of Well-Being of Young Children, or the SWIC. And uh, the SWIC is a developmental behavioral screening instrument for children under five and a half years old. It's a first level, sort of triage level screening instrument that is completed by parents and caregivers in, at home or in the waiting room. And it includes four components. Uh, one is cognitive language and motor development, which is typically called developmental screening. Uh, the second section is social, emotional, and behavioral adjustment, which is typically called behavioral screening. We also screen for autism at the appropriate ages. And then there's a section that we call family risk factors, which has been mentioned earlier this, today in, uh, in the category of social determinants. Um, that's a big category, and many people have dealt with it in different ways. Um, we purposely made the screening instrument very brief and simple so that it only takes about 10 or 15 minutes to complete, and it's written in very uh, short simple language so that parents know the answer to the question from memory. They don't have to go home and kind of consider whether their child can do this or that or ask anyone else about it. It doesn't require any pictures or diagrams. And all the pediatricians we consulted with as we were creating this said, it has to fit on one piece of paper. So it does, in fact, fit on two sides of one piece of paper. <laughs> um, it's available at no cost. It can just be pulled down from the internet. And it's available so far in several languages and clearly needs to be translated into others when we have uh, time and resources to do that. Um, it's formatted for use at every well child visit until five and a half years of age so that um, our, our hope and our fantasy is that it will become part of well child care for every child at every visit. Um, and therefore, it allows ongoing monitoring of the child over time. It produces essentially like a little growth, growth curve. Instead of being weighed on a scale, the child, the child would be monitored based on the responses to those questions. Um, a number of pediatricians have told us that actually the every visit um, suggestion or recommendation simplifies things for them because they don't have to think about do I have to do this screening at this age or that other kind of screening at this other age they just do the SWIC at every age based on the child's just on the child's birth date so uh, our initial um, validation research would suggest that its reliability and validity are comparable to those of other popular screeners and um, uh, it's valid across gender, race, ethnicity, and SES. Um, we're in the process of, we have a, some NIH funding to do some uh, further validity studies against uh, c comparing it to standardized assessments, and we'll be able to report that in a year or two. Um, we, we, Chris is going to talk a little bit more about this, but I'll just say for now that we have prioritized sensitivity. so. We, we wanted to be sure that we were identifying all or almost all of affected children and missing as few as possible. And we recognize that by doing that, we will have some false positives and rec uh, identify some children who are, who are um, not affected, who are doing fine. Um, sorry. And so for that reason, uh, we don't consider referral to someone else outside of the pediatric office or even inside of the pediatric office as the appropriate next step, but rather uh, that this would be a, a way to start conversations with parents. It would, it would uh, sort of hone, on, hone in on observations of the child and of the child's relationship with the parent. 
it would allow for dis uh, pointed discussion with other people who know the child, so another parent, teachers, grandparents, and so forth. And potentially, it would even be appropriate to um, administer another kind of screening test to follow up on what the SWIC had determined. Um, so we don't we don't see this as a kind of answer, or as I say, it's not a it's not a diagnosis or even a definition of risk. It's really an indication that something more some more conversation is necessary, and only then is referral. So I want to run you through very quickly. Uh, what it looks like. So this is just an example. I'm not expecting you to be able to read the words, but just to give you a picture of it. So this is the front and the back of the 24-month form. Just chose that one as an example. Um, and I'll run through what the pieces are. So on the top of the first page is the section on cognitive language and motor milestones. Um, and there, for every age, uh, there are, are 10 items. And obviously, the questions are different because kids do different things at different ages. Um, the bottom half of the first page is the, in, includes the emotional or behavioral symptoms. Um, and there's one form for children up to 18 months, which is this one, and another form for children, or, or another set of questions for children from 18 months up to, 50, up, up to five and a half. Um, there, it's, these are very simple to score. The, the response options are not at all somewhat and very much, and you just add up the score. and get a number, which we, again, is not worth going through the details of what the score, what the root, what the abnormal and abnormal, what the threshold is. But basically, I'm trying to explain how simple this is to do. Um, on the back of the form, uh, there are two items that just ask parents if they're concerned about their child's learning, behavior, or development. And then uh, on every form, on every age form, there are a set of nine, I nine items that address parents' substance abuse uh, history, food security, depression, and domestic violence risk, risk. And then for children in the right age group, so from about 15 to 35 months, uh, we also have a brief autism screener as a part of this, which uh, is called the POSI, Parents' Observation of Social Interactions. We wanted to keep autism out of the title. Um, and that um, that's also very simple to score and identifies, again, identifies risk of autism, which would then need follow-up if it were positive. Um, this whole system is easily amenable to electronic formats. We, we thought from the beginning that this would end up being either incorporated into electronic records or be administered on the telephone or on smartphones or in various other electronic ways, which also has the opportunity, provides the opportunity of creating an audio version so that for people with limited literacy, um, this would be available to them in, in an audio form in whatever language we have it translated into. So we're really, we have focused a lot on access and um, making this available to as many people as possible. Um, so just in summary, uh, the SWIC offers a feasible way for pediatricians to assess a child's overall well-being. It's, uh, it's not quite as specific as what Jack would like to develop in terms of um, an actual biomarker that explains which, child, which children are um, experiencing toxic stress, but it does um, it provides us with a picture of how well this child is doing in the context in which he or she is living. Um, the, the entire instrument matches the standard pediatric well-child visit schedule. It's available at no cost and in several languages. So we're in the midst of doing um, quite a bit of ongoing research about this, and I'm going to let Chris tell you a bit more about that, uh, and then we can take questions after that. You don't want this, right? Nah, good. Um, hi, I'm Chris. So um, we've heard a lot today about how awful the world is, rising inequality, rising poverty, rising suicide rates, rising developmental disabilities, rising behavioral and emotional disabilities. And yet we've created this wonderful instrument. And despite its wonderful reception and the impact we feel we've had and the support we've gotten, which has been gratifying, um, world peace has not yet broken out. So it seems like there's still some to do. Um, and I have to say, as, I'm, as I've been sitting in this conference and listening to the other talks, 
um, I wish I could go home and have about a day to rewrite my talk and and really think about responding to everything I've heard about um, throughout the day because it's it's the the potential for collab for collaboration seems so strong. So please just think of these as as thoughts along the way. Um, but in uh, reference to Jack Shankov's talk this morning, he brought up the idea of there being different stages of innovation as we go along. And I'd say that so far, what we've been really trying to do is meet standards. Um, Fan Tate talked about how we're getting more and more pediatricians to use evidence-based screening instruments in practice, and we think that's a good thing. And really, the, the SWIC is built on the existing science that we know around psychometrics and screening and questionnaires. Um, so then the question is what to, uh, how to take it to the next level. So, Dr. Shankov uh, talked about the next level as um, being delivering state-of-the-art uh, science. So in um, assessment, the state-of-the-art in our field right now really comes around assessing diagnostic accuracy very, very well. And there's criteria that we use to really, really think about that. And as Ellen mentioned, we have a grant from NICHD to really look in closely at the diagnostic accuracy of our instrument. So very briefly, we have pediatricians, uh, uh, we go into pediatrician's office and we enroll parents and ask them to fill out packets of screening instruments on their young kids. That includes our screening instruments, but also other high quality screening instruments that are used in the field. Everyone who screens positive on anything and a random sample of kids who screen um, negative on everything get invited to do kind of a gold standard um, comprehensive diagnostic ass assessment. And the data are going to allow us to really understand better the diagnostic accuracy of the SWIC, but also to be able to compare it to these other instruments to see the strengths and the weaknesses. Because honestly, ours is short, others are longer and more comprehensive, they have different models, and I think what we expect is that there's going to be a mix. I don't think there's going to be a clear winner, but we'll see. Um, and again, as has constantly been suggested throughout this conference, there's the potential to be wrong, which is why we do the science, so we'll find out. But at the same time, what we're also trying to do is to really push the science of screening a little bit and to really think about things differently. Because what diagnostic accuracy is all about, what, it come, what a, that whole study comes down to, is really trying to assess the sensitivity and the specificity of the instrument. So um, just to be clear, when I say sensitivity, I'm talking about the proportion of, of um, a population with a disorder. That, that we're talking about the, the proportion who will be detected by a screening instrument. So how many kids with disabilities are really going to be detected by the screening instrument? And with specificity, of the kids without disorders, how many of those kids, what proportion will be correctly classified as not having a problem. So these are the kind of standard metrics that we use all the time in, in diagnostic accuracy. But a recent report from the, um, you know, formerly known as Institute of Medicine, now National Academy of Medicine, on improving diagnosis of healthcare really kind of gives a different and I think richer model for how to think about this. Um, I think I made it small enough so that you can't actually read it. But there's some really important concepts here that don't come into the standard diagnostic accuracy studies, um, including the fact that the diagnostic process is often iterative and it can take time. They really talk about engagement with families as being central to the diagnostic process. They talk about communication with families as being central to the diagnostic process because a diagnosis in an EMR doesn't make any difference if it's not communicated to the family and doesn't affect the treatment protocol. Um, they talk about using teams of diagnosticians and effective communication among the teams is being critical to reducing diagnostic errors. So to me, this IOM report really focuses on um, screening and diagnosis and the, the throughput to treatment as an entire process. And it really begs the question of, well, how does a new screening instrument impact that process? And what are all the things that we think are important in screening beyond just sensitivity and specificity? So as an example, um, working in another project with some collaborators from Northeastern University and from UMass Boston, we're trying to think about, in a very basic way, starting out with screening as a process. So we can ask questions like, you know, what proportion of kids actually arrive for their pediatric visit? Um, of those, what proportion actually receive an evidence-based screening instrument? Then if they get screening beyond that, how does the screening instrument actually impact the clinical exam? Does it change the physician's decision making or screening, is that communicated to the patient? Um, does it change the, the, the probability that they're actually going to receive a full diagnostic evaluation or a referral for treatment? But thinking about that whole chain of events and thinking about how that's iterate, uh, iterated over time. Because what really matters here isn't just the, uh, the sensitivity and the specificity of the screening instrument itself, it's the sensitivity and the specificity of the whole process for treating kids, treating families, and trying to bring them into care. Um, those curves 
are a pure simulation. They bear no resemblance to reality. I could say a little bit more about that, but I won't now. So needless to say, when thinking about that process, there's a lot to do. And there's more than just the diagnostic accuracy of the instrument. Um, there's clearly thinking about translations of instruments to, to uh, hit other um, populations of, of kids and families. There's the whole issue of engaging families and, and what kind of messaging really works with them to help them understand and feel activated around their child more. Um, there's the issue of how do you get these things into electronic health records at all? I mean, that turns out to be a more complicated thing than one might think. And then, as I mentioned, the whole issue of clinical decision making and process optimization. So, again, I think one of the solutions that we're realizing around this is that the list of things that need to be done is far too long for any one of us to do, which is the exciting thing about being at a conference that's so much built around collaboration is this one. So what we found is that um, a lot of the translation work that's been done has been done um, in our account through uh, partnerships with other groups and other organizations. Those Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, but those uh, the next two logos that you probably can't read are two different universities in Brazil. And then there's one in Nigeria as well, which explains the Yoruba. Now, because our instrument is, is available for free and we consider it to be in the public domain, these different um, groups have stepped up and felt very happy and motivated around contributing. And, and this is the kind of work that we never would have been able to do just on our own. Um, the uh, tribal early childhood group at the University of Colorado at Denver has done a wonderful qualitative study um, looking at the acceptability of the SWIC in a variety of Native American tribes around the country. Again, this is work we never ever would have been able to do. And I'll have to say too, for the science of it also, um, I was just speaking with someone before this too, I, if I had done the study myself and had really positive findings, I wouldn't believe it as much. The fact that someone else did it, independent of us, that independent replication part is very, very important. So. Um, I think collaboration allows for that in a different way. Um, various electronic health record companies and companies that try to deliver patient reported outcome tools and other ways have also stepped up and have been very interested in incorporating the instrument as well. Um, so all of those things have been completely essential. And I'll add as well um, that part of the, the funding we've been very fortunate to get has been to work with an organization called uh, Root Cause, which has helped us with the sustainability planning and the business planning around the SWIC. And it's very much helped us realize other issues that are critical for collaboration that we just haven't really understood before. And I'll just mention that funding is an obvious one to everybody, but the other one that I think is clearly very important is intellectual property. And at least in our field, IP gets talked about very seldom, but who actually owns these instruments turns out to be a complicated question. And if we're gonna have innovation in the future around really anything in science or figure out how to spin out different business models to support their sustainability in the future, we need to understand these issues better. So it's that, that work with root cause has really helped us understand that in a much greater extent. Um, so in thinking through um, clinical decision making, I'll give you a very brief example of, of one of the things that we're talking about. Um, and this, in some ways, is, again, very similar to what Jack Shonkoff was showing earlier about how, for evidence-based practices, if there's a mean effect, we consider it to be an evidence-based practice, and that that can obscure the fact that some kids, are in fact, are doing much better and other kids are doing much worse. Uh, there's a similar thing that goes on with these screening instruments. So imagine for a second you have a screening instrument and it has a continuous score. Uh, along the bottom. We've seen lots of instruments like that today. Now imagine you have a healthy population of children and they score with a certain average value, but obviously there's variance around that average value. Now imagine you have a, a population of children who are affected by some sort of disability or toxic stress. The point of the screener is to detect these kids. So if the screener works, it means that these, these kids on average are gonna score higher. But if you look at the dispersion, if you look at the variability, there's gonna be overlap between these curves. So to make it a little easier to see, I will just flip that curve below. Now, if these were the scores in a screening instrument, the next question that we would have to address is you know, where are we gonna draw the line? Where is our threshold gonna be? So let's just say for the sake of argument, we draw it there and everyone to the right screens positive, everyone to the left screens negative. You can see that because everyone above the line is in a healthy population, you can see who the true negatives and the false positives are. Because everyone below the line, uh, it comes from a, a population with disabilities, those were the false negatives and the true positives are. Now, to go back to the terms a little bit, I will just kind of preface this by saying too that 
I, we drew these curves, these are kind of like just a model, but we drew these curves to represent an accurate screening instrument. So this screening instrument has good sensitivity and good specificity. We'll get to the numbers in a second, but believe me for now. You can see the specificity by looking below the curve. What You can ask yourself, what proportion of kids below the, cur uh, below the horizontal axis are detected successfully by the screener, fall to the right. So it's the light gray area over the total curve. So it, it's, a, it's a good percentage, it's well over 70%. For specificity, you can look at among the healthy population, what proportion are correctly classified. Again, the light gray over the total gray curve. It's, it's, it's a good percentage, right? So good sensitivity and specificity, everything's good. If I had done my diagnostic accuracy study, I could publish that, it would look lovely. It would be an evidence-based screening instrument. But when we give it to pediatricians in the field, what they see are the individual children. So we need to think about that as well. Now, one metric also that I think people are generally aware of but gets published less often is this thing called positive predictive value. So as a pediatrician, you're not so interested necessarily in sensitivity and specificity. What you want to know is, okay, well, a kid came in and now I have a positive screening score. What's the chance that this child actually has the disability that I'm trying to screen for? Well, positive predictive value can tell us that. So if you look at the true positives, the kids under the curve, um, the total gray area basically is everyone who screens positive, right? And the kids under the horizontal axis are the ones you actually wanted to detect. So you can kind of take a wild guess at, about what the positive predictive value is. Does anyone want to take a wild guess about what the proportion is? A little try to wake us up in the afternoon a little bit, a little quiz. I'm getting 50, 60, that's definitely ballpark. Kind of lower than what you think of for 60. So you can imagine yourself being a pediatrician. Are you willing to make a choice? Are you willing to make a referral decision based on that number? Are you willing to refer if there's a 50 or 60, you know, 50% chance of disorder? Depends, right, on what the disorder is. It depends on what the, um, uh, the treatment availability is, all those sorts of things. But it's actually a little more complicated because ask yourself now, if a child scores right there where that arrow is on a very, very high score, what's that ch child's chance of having a disability? And how does it compare to a child who scores right here? Those are very different numbers, obviously. The child who scores very high has a very high chance of disability in this little model, and the child down here has a much lower chance of disability. So when we were thinking about what are our recommendations for the screening instrument and how people are supposed to use them, we started thinking about this thing called threshold probability, which um, is rarely talked about. Um, if you think about it, positive predictive value averages across this whole positive range. And what it's doing is exactly what Dr. Shankov is talking about. It's averaging very high probabilities of disability with very low probabilities of disability. If you look at the kids who score right at the threshold, and remember, if our recommendation is to do something with everyone who scores at the threshold or above, then an individual pediatrician who has someone score at the threshold, they have to be willing to do it for that child. So what's the probability of disability at the threshold? Well, it's actually the length of that line, that's the probability of being in the population with disability, over the total of the two, much lower. If you can think of that ratio, it's actually quite small. So again, as a little wake up quiz, I'm trying to set out a, a pretty positive view of screening instruments. So I'm saying pretty high prevalence. I'm talking about developmental behavioral problems overall, 20% prevalence. Good screener, 77% sensitivity is at 77% specificity. I don't know if you think that's good in your field, but in our field, that's quite good with a questionnaire, so we're pretty happy with that. Positive predictive value is actually 46%, so pretty close to 50%. What do you think the threshold probability is? So for a child who scores at the threshold with these distributions, what's the probability of dis disability? 25%. Getting 20, 25, 21%. So now, if we're asking pediatricians to do something based on this score, are they going to be willing to do it if they have a one in five chance of being right, approximately? We need to be sure that the recommendations are appropriate to this level of psychometrics and that when we're mixing up these different numbers, all this heterogeneity, it has to be right in the end. Um, so in, this is kind of an example of where we're going in terms of this clinical decision making. Um, I'll also say that if a pediatrician is not willing to refer, for example, someone who's right at the threshold, and we hear this from people, they don't necessarily trust the lower scores that are too close to the threshold. What they're effectively doing is by only referring kids who score higher is more or less setting informally a higher threshold. So when we you know, write our manual and give our trainings, we ask um, pediatricians to reflect on this. Okay, well, if you set a higher threshold, what happens to the positive predictive value? Well, it goes up, right? You'll, if you refer only those kids, you'll be right more often. That's great. And the threat, and the, the, but what happens to the sensitivity? What's the trade-off here? You look here, many fewer kids are being detected. So in this case, 
if you move the threshold up to get a 50% threshold probability, so you, that you have at least a 50% chance of being right with every single patient, your sensitivity goes down to 43%. So you're going to detect only a small portion of the population. So we develop these, these curves in terms of thinking about the SWIC and in terms of thinking about what, what's real, re, realistic here. And it's what um, informed our view to really think about them as a tool for for pediatricians. So now with this in mind, if you were going to see, uh, you know, you're bringing your child in, say, to Nadine Burke Harris's um, clinic, and you have a choice of a decision being made for your child purely on the basis of a screening instrument versus screening in uh, instrument informing a very highly experienced clinician, which one are you going to do? This has, I think, implications for how we roll out these interventions and the, and the role of human decision making in these interventions and in these um, screening uh, initiatives as we go out. So as we, uh, as we move along, we're also kind of trying to develop more complicated models and we're thinking about thresholds more deeply. So for example, um, using system dynamics models, which I'll say, by the way, system dynamics really had its, uh, it, it has its home and had its birth here at MIT in the Sloan School, so we're indebted to them there. But thinking about how physicians' uh, decision thresholds may vary over time or be uh, sort of more or less accurate depending on the accuracy of the feedback that the physicians are given um, can be very important. Um, I'll also say that with these system dynamics models, as we think about moving things out into the real world, there's such a huge range of evidence. And uh, I happen to know that system, I'm not a molecular biologist by any means, but I happen to know that system dynamics is actually used in some areas of molecular biology to try to understand the complexity of the data. And I've also seen examples of it being used to sort of create models to uh, synthesize evidence on the molecular level, but also crossing the skin into the, to the social realm. So, you know, we heard about talking about family chaos and ACEs and how can we really integrate our knowledge and, and think about the about kids really truly from neurons to neighborhoods. I think uh, system dynamics might give us a way forward to have those conversations in, in an interdisciplinary way across fields. So um, to conclude, I will just say that if you are at all interested in the SWIC, we have our uh, all these forms that uh, we mentioned on, online. We just published a manual that tries to talk about these, uh, these different issues of implementation and our recommendations for clinical decision making. Um, we hope that a lot of it's right. We're sure that some of it's wrong because we uh, collaborate and we're scientists. We hope we can improve it in the, in the future. And uh, I thank you very much for listening and I look forward to your input. So I just, um, Chris mentioned our ongoing work with this group called Root Cause, and I just wanted to acknowledge the, the wisdom of um, the Pickauer Foundation and Barbara Pickauer in funding and supporting and in, sorry, the JPB Foundation, um, in funding and supporting that work because um, it's one thing to develop this measure and it's another to disseminate it and bring it to scale. And that's what Root Cause is trying to help us do. And um, I'm not sure we would have had the wisdom to even realize that we needed that until um, fairly recently. So thank you. <laughs>